Hey, massage friends. Welcome to the USOLMT Massage Podcast. I'm Stephanie Rodriguez, your host and the founder and executive director of USOLMT, your new massage association. We're here to educate, elevate, encourage, and empower present and future massage therapists to look to the future, get involved, and push our industry forward through positive change. Let's get into today's topic. I want to welcome my guests today. I have Dee Vickers and Jimmy Giolillis. Dee is a board certified massage therapist. Um, She is the former director of Gould's Academy of Massage, nationally approved massage and body work continuing educator, and the owner and lead educator for Massage CE Education. She has been a professional educator for over 20 years and combining her passion for education and massage over the last 10 years. Her clinical specialty in private practice is TMJ disorder massage, fertility and pregnancy massage, and rehabilitative body work. Dee got a bachelor's and master's degree from Auburn University in education, as well as her massage therapy certification from Gadsden State Community College, and she interned under Patricia Casebeer, who is a direct apprentice of Dr. Janet Travell, the founder of Trigger Point Therapy. Um, Her classes are a lively blend of hands-on skills, inspiring information, and lighthearted methods. Her approach to massage and bodywork education is hands-on with a focus on individual attention to participants, mentoring massage therapists, and building massage community are an integral part of her mission. I love that. And I also have Jimmy Giolillis with me. So Jimmy is a board certified licensed massage therapist and educator, bringing over 21 years of experience in the massage and bodywork industry. Jimmy owns Advanced Massage Arts and Education in Tempe, Arizona, and he has taught health and massage theme classes in 11 states and across Arizona. Jimmy regularly contributes to the IMBLEX, the Massage and Body Work Licensing Exam, as an exam writer. He also volunteers for the Massage Therapy Foundation in varying capacities, and his passions are to serve humanity with the healing power of touch and educate fellow massage therapists to elevate the credibility of the profession. Jimmy has authored over 40 articles for Massage Magazine and Natural Wellness Online, and mentoring massage therapists is the next step in his career. So thank you, both of you, for being on the show. Welcome. Glad to have you here. So I want to kind of start off by talking about current business education. I went to a Corteva school and my business curriculum was based off Massage Business Mastery by Cherie Sohn and Mo at Sohn and Mo Associates. And I'm just kind of wondering, like, is this still the gold standard of massage business education? Are there other resources out there? And I wasn't really sure. And I thought maybe the two of you would know. I, there's a couple of authors that come to mind. One is Laura Allen, who teaches uh, wonderful classes on business theme items and topics, as well as Diane Thompson put a great book out about 15 years ago called Hands Heal. It's more about business communication. And so I'm definitely a big fan of those two authors, as well as Cherie's great work, of course. Um, but certainly those other two authors, I think do a great job too, presenting you know, good quality material that can be included in programs. For me, um, this is a shameless plug I'm going to uh, put in here. Uh, Kelly Bowers and I wrote a book called Between Doormat and Diva, which is a customer service book for massage therapists, and it's business focused. Um, It's a very small little book, but it's a quick read to help people understand the customer service side of massage, that that really is the root of building and maintaining clientele. But I think that we have to get outside of just books and lecture for real business education to get into more of an experiential, personalized touch for Mm. business education. I love that. You guys went to massage school 20 something years ago. Did you guys get any business education? We did. We had, um, I think like most schools, a unit in business education, and it mostly focused on entrepreneurship, how to start a business, how to get your basics. I think for me, it wasn't so overwhelming because I have a business degree before I went to massage school, but for, for classmates of mine, I think it was so in depth that it was like, 
too much. The, the dive into it was too deep and it was almost too much, you know, to write a five-year projected business plan with full financials and all this kind of, it was just, it was too much. And it, and it became overwhelming to the point where it sort of shut down the dream. And, and that is disappointing to me because it can be simplified. You know, we can have level A and level B, level A of just getting the doors open and, you know, putting a table up, hanging a lamp in the corner and get the doors open and the plan B, a little deeper dive of having a full-fledged corporate business that's running with employees and that kind of thing. And so I think we have to balance the, the deep dive to it because our, ours went off the cliff into the Grand Canyon with it. And it was just, I think it shut people down. Yeah, I could see that. It's a great observation there. Yes, I, I, I attended Utah College and Massage Therapy, and we had about 35 hours worth of professional development classes, we call them, at our school. And I definitely agree with you, Dee. At, at times, it could have seemed a little too much for an entry level. I feel like, although there's, it's interesting at some schools, like at our school, the Steiner Education School, we had different cohorts. And sometimes we'd have a cohort that was very uh, much into business mindset, give me more. Other cohorts were saying, we don't want to even do this uh, for ourselves for a while. We'd all much rather work for Massage Envy. So it became interesting how we had to play with the class a bit. As I, when I was teaching professional development, I played a lot of mental gymnastics. You know, what is the majority of this class really into employment or being the employer or being a private practice. Uh, in Arizona, we have a unique situation where Massage Envy was born here. The franchises and chains, uh, that mentality uh, became, kind of was born here and spawned here. So we have a lot of, we're like number one in our country as far as per capita spas in the nation. So I guess it made sense that in our area of the country, we had to gear the professionalism classes, business classes more. How do you be a good employee? Since a lot of graduates are going to be employees at these places. I think around the country, we'd have to play with that and see how many people do want to work for it, be an employee or other people want to be a private practitioner. The percentages I'm sure are very different, different parts of the country. Yeah, that was actually one of my questions um, about improving massage business education, because I think the first question that everybody asks is, how do I get my clients, right? And then the, the parts that I feel are really important are like, how do you manage a business? How do you market a business? And when we're thinking about education, it's like, are we supposed to gear that towards private practice? Do we gear it towards expanded practice with employees? Do we talk about cooperative business models? But like, what does that curriculum look like? And is it even available now? I don't think that there is a model that has been widely accepted. If you look at it like a tree and you have the trunk, which is professional education, business education, then from there you have so many branches. And I think if we have a curriculum, we need a branch that shows options, right? That says a br this branch is be an employee. This branch is work for a co-op. This branch is be a sole practitioner entrepreneur. This branch is full-fledged corporate model and just sort of give people their options like a buffet because we're going to have people graduate and today they think I want to be this and they might try that and they find out, mm, I don't like this. I want to try something else, or this doesn't really work for me, or my lifestyle has changed. And I need to, for my lifestyle and for my family, back up and take a different road. And so I think exposing that is very valuable to giving all the branches that are available. And to my knowledge, there's that curriculum doesn't exist. But through, we have the organization, you know, the AFMTE, and they're doing the ELAP and the core curriculums, which are very valuable, but we haven't seen the absolute acceptance of that and the business section of that, which may be a long time coming, a standardized business curriculum, because it's going to be a dynamic curriculum.
Mm -hmm. Well, there lies the fine art of teaching, uh, be able to be able to read a group and be able to recognize, okay, this group needs more of this kind of content versus that kind of content. So being able to train teachers that way is, is awesome. And the more, the more I teach business classes these days, the more I realize I'm teaching a lot of life skills. And I love right. that. I, I love that as we go through and have any sort I mean, when I teach marketing classes, my students are usually surprised that the first half of the class isn't the ideas and how to market. It's about really recognizing who you are, where you are in business, where you are in life, and what, what's going to take to get to that next level. And then we'll talk about marketing ideas. So I think it's really healthy that uh, we have curricula that really help people recognize that, in, especially in a vocational school setting, people from all walks of life coming into our classroom. Some people are ready for a business, some people are not. And how do we help people every, wherever they are in their progression? Jimmy, I think you nailed it with the life skills piece. There, there is a financial literacy element that is so important because some people have never even, you know, looked into how to do a budget or how to manage a seed fund or, you know, things like that. So the financial literacy, even just down to the basics and you think, oh, well, this is an older cohort or something like that doesn't necessarily mean they have good financial literacy. So true. And I, I love your point before, Dee, about the, the ideas of you know, how do we tailor a, a program or make it to a standard that we can kind of make a buffet-like setting. I, I really am a fan of what you said before about having a, a, a tiered system. Uh, there's like a level A class that, okay, teaches you the basics. If you feel compelled to pursue a private practice, here's the next level of courses you could take. Or if that's not you right now, that's okay. You can go be an employee for a while. Here's some other classes to take and how to be a great employee. I think the hardest thing in entry level education is trying to mix those types of content together and half the class doesn't really, you know, they tune out at some point because I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. So I'm going to tune out. That became a fine art of teaching idea again of how do we get everyone to still pay attention <laughs> to these ideas that maybe they're not really ready to hear. Yeah, I think that um, it would be a great idea to maybe have it be project based learning. And then, you know, whatever the student is interested in, they can go on their own and pursue more and maybe do a project of what is it like to be an employee or what is it like to be a sole proprietor? What do they need to um, hire employees and have a big spa business? So maybe guiding them in that way would be a good idea. And I think there's a there's a potential for schools to have the entry level program, and then have some voluntary advanced trainings that are, you know, beyond the core, whatever it is, 500, 600, 800 curriculum hours to say, once you've graduated, if you would like additional modules of training, we have additional training in this, this, and this that are business related. So if someone opts to go that road or they get out and they say, oh, I just want to be an employee. And then they go, you know, maybe I would like to have my own business. I'm going to go back to my school and take two or three of these advanced module classes. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent idea. And, and I would also say, you know, there's a lot of continuing education teachers out there who do business mentoring. I'll, I'll be doing this myself as well next year uh, with my own, well, that later this year, now I can say <laughs> this year, yeah. uh, but it's really nice to be able to kind of put that out there because mentoring is such a necessary thing, knowing that, again, so many people lack, I, I like the term you use, financial literacy or just business acumen. Uh, so I think that's, we need more professionals that are more seasoned to be willing to be mentors in this way. Yeah, absolutely. I have, I've started a free mentoring program where people can come and meet for an hour online once a month. They can ask any questions that they want. And I'm trying to get educators together to actually start this mentor program. Um, and then I'm going to be contacting the schools to try to get that out to students so that we can have people come on. And if they have questions, they can actually talk to some massage therapists who are experienced face to face and get their questions answered. So exactly. Wonderful. Yeah. Great idea. Yeah. And I know Dee, you had some um, comments about mentoring too. So yes, mentoring, I think is the key because when I taught in foundational education, when I was a director of a school, that was a huge push for me was to pair students with a mentor while they were in school. They could, you know, have someone to help talk to them, help them with real life feedback. But 
once they left school, they carried on with that relationship so that they had that connection and could go out in the community and have that connection. So when they incur, they encounter things, they can reach out to that mentor and say, what do I do when this happens? Or what can you suggest that I do for this? And then that mentor can help guide that relationship and provide that supervision element because that's such a critical piece if people want to be sole practitioners and they're working isolated to have that person to be able to reach out to and have that supervision and they keep that relationship going. But it is a struggle to get people to mentor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. (laughs) Is it certainly there has to be a, a we call that in economics an incentive. So what's the incentive there? And the incentive hopefully can be some sort of arrangement where um, there's some sort of um, I don't want to say payment, but always have always a monetary payment. Just the ability for people to be recognized um, may help some educators get on board with that idea. In the end, I know that um, we are an industry, though, that is of connection and compassion. And I really believe that there's enough educators who are willing to show that compassion to offer this without a hefty price tag. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. And I I mean, there are some really wonderful massage business coaches, but I don't know that everybody has the funding to be able to do that, especially right out of school. And so I think having some free mentorship is a great idea. And I love what you said, Dee, about actually connecting people when they're in school, because, you know, I look back and I had some business background before I became a massage therapist, but I still wish that I would have had that. Well, as Jimmy said, there is an element of financial incentive that an energy exchange, because it doesn't always have to be monetary, right? To say, you know, I would like for you to mentor me and here's what I can offer in return for your time. It may not necessarily be cash, but it could be other things like maybe you trade out a massage, you know, give them a massage for some time that you spend with them, or if there's some other resource that you have that you could barter, you know, if you make cakes on the side and you could offer them some, you know, baking things or something that, you know, shows some value to the energy they're giving you. Excellent point, Dee. We know that uh, if people will definitely give more effort on average if there's a value placed upon it than if I'm just giving it for free okay, it's nice information. There's just something about human nature, right? If I have to put a little more effort into it, more energy exchange, it will mean more to me. So I may give actually even that much more effort towards it. Oh, totally. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about what qualifies an instructor to teach business. Hmm. Well, for some states, it's (laughs) state regulation. Some states don't have state regulation for that but some states do. So that's point level one is if the particular state has regulation for educators and even specifically business educators, some states do have specific regulation for teaching business classes. Um, That's the first ground, but absent of state level regulation, I think that you have to look at their education and training just like they were teaching anything else. Mm -hmm. There could also be an accreditation standard idea, perhaps the three years, for example, for asset accreditation, three years minimum necessary. But even then, it could be just different depending on the accreditation agency we're a part of, too. Jimmy, do you think we need a model curriculum for business? A model curricula for business. I think it's so difficult to create a standard that could be ubiquitously taught considering each st- so many states with varying requirements and varying uh, educational standards. I think it's, I, I like the idea. I think it's just so hard to make happen in a country that has 50 states and 50 different thoughts, 50 different opinions on what petrosage even is. So <laughs> let alone, I, th- I think that's a hard dynamic. It's like a blessing and a curse of our industry that the blessing is so many great professionals teach massage in beautiful ways, eloquence to their work, uh, great great quality of touch in their work. At the same time, I know there's a, there's a certain population that would say, nope, massage should all be taught only this one way, and that's just not our field. <laughs> I think there's something that can be um, challenging about our field that we definitely want national standards, but who's going to make the standards? Are we, are we able to convince 
other people from all states that believe that your way is better than their way. That's the really hard thing about this. And we get this in Emblex, you know, working with Emblex, we get a lot of people who kind of uh, question why we make the questions that we make. And, you know, again, people in all parts of the country disagree on massage definitions and how it should even be presented. So I guess I want to say I would love to see a model standard curricula, but I'm not sure if it's feasible for our kind of industry where there's so much room for liberty of expression of our of our work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we definitely do have that. What do you think, Dee? I think if there was going to be an attempt at a model curriculum, I think Jimmy is absolutely right that you can't have a set dyna- a set program that says it's A, B, C, and D. I think the approach would be something like modules that could be picked and choose that fits your local community. You know, like you have a dozen modules and these modules cover these pieces because maybe this community may feel like financial literacy is a big piece for them. So they pick that piece of the puzzle and plug that in for their community because they feel like they have a big need for that. And maybe an individual class may lean more towards one thing more than another. So you could pick the pieces. It's almost like going and looking at a barrel of apples and you pick the apples that suit you for your need, for what you're doing. That if you had a curriculum like that, that was broken up into modules and pieces, so it could be flexed in and out based on the local market, even down to what that cohort needed, Mm -hmm. then I think you can have some sort of standardization but you can have flexibility to tailor it for what that group needs in their market and in their cohort. Yeah. Great point. point. If I can add to a a really good curricula writer, will be able to add those business elements into any particular uni course as well. So I I remember I I redid a shiatsu course for the old ASMT Arizona School of Massage course many years ago and kind of made sure I added some um, here's how you sell the work as well. Yeah, here's how you do the work. Here's the cool theory around the, the Chinese medicine theory, but also here's some talking points about selling the work because the average person will never hear of the word shiatsu in general uh, conversation. So how do you get people to understand what shiatsu is and sell the work quickly and efficiently? I think, I think we have to kind of think about this. I think good curricular writers can do that in the, the entirety of a whole curricular course uh, program, entry level program. I think that we definitely can uh, call upon that. Look at each particular course is there a business theme topic to each course we teach if not let's add it in yeah yeah i think that's great i love the idea of having different options for people to pick and choose different options for the educator um so i mean i think that one of the things that might be helpful also even if we aren't able to get a standard model curriculum out there, right? But to give students a list of resources, like where can they go look online to find some free resources that will help them set up their business and get things going the way that they want to, right? So I know like SCORE, SCORE is a really good resource. It gives you a free business mentor. You can find one in your local area. What other resources might there be out there that you guys know about? SCORE is huge. SCORE is a really big one. The SBA has resources um, online. Sometimes there's local workshops, but you can also reach out to community groups too, like the business women's professional group or, you know, the rotaries and things like that. A mentor or resources doesn't necessarily for business, doesn't necessarily have to be massage. You could go and talk to the florist on the corner and get some interview with them, get some feedback from them. How do you market your flowers? How do you find that you find your customers? Because it's a similar, but sort of complementary business. If you wanna do pregnancy massage, going and talking to someone who owns a sonography studio and you know, going and talking to them, how do you find your clients? A prenatal yoga teacher, how do you find your clients? How have you found it? complementary but not competitive and finding out what worked for them because a lot of these resources we're talking about are national resources but what works in small town with you know a very small population maybe a very different animal than what's going to work in Chicago or Dallas or LA going to be a whole different ball game and I would talk to the people on the ground 
in the trenches doing it in complementary and similar businesses. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Indeed. I would also add to business networking groups that we have locally are very important to tap into becoming a part of any one available business networking group. And here in the big urban area like Phoenix, we have 35 available to us uh, specific towards any type of a genre of our field, you know, maybe more rural areas, only one or two, but that's okay. I think in the end, I like to tell my students to please create a tribe. You either join a tribe or create your own. And I think as we start to create that tribe and and really foster our relationship, the therapeutic relationships with those individuals in our tribe, we're able to really expand from there. So that's something I'd always always share in my marketing classes with students. Yeah, that's a really good idea. I would also recommend Toastmasters. I think Toastmasters is a great group. It can help you perfect your pitches, your marketing pitches pitches, and help you get comfortable speaking in front of people, which is a great way to market your business. And you can market to the Toastmasters group as well and get those people on your table. So yeah. I think the best marketing by far, bar none, is connecting with your community, reaching out to veteran therapists in your community, and saying, I'm a new therapist. I'd like to give you a sample 30 minute massage. And then you would feel if you would feel comfortable referring your overflow clients to me, because there are a lot of veteran therapists out there that have full books and they're turning people away. But if they had a therapist, then they say, oh, well, this therapist over here is you know, just coming into our market and I've had a massage by them and they give a good massage and I can give you their contact information. These people already have a flow. They're already getting people coming to them. So connecting, like Jimmy said, connecting in that community and networking, that's cheap. (laughs) People are more than happy to pass your name along because then they don't have to give someone a no. They can give someone an alternative. And it's cheap, free advertising. Very true. Very good point. And I like to think about, you know, if I think about who succeeds and who doesn't, I mean, it's hard to determine what does the word success mean in our field. I find that, though, that the most successful businesses tend to be an extension of our authentic self. So helping, especially that newer graduate who just graduated, they have so many cool ideas. So they took so many amazing classes, but now what? Well, I was going to ask, hey, what resonates with you most? Which course of all the 25 classes in your curricula, which did you resonate most with? Let's start there. And let's really try to make sure that you kind of put a lot of yourself in your business. People will recognize that and recognize that you're being really real and authentic. And I'm going to trust someone who is going to be real and authentic. Absolutely. I like authenticity. I think that people can kind of see through it when you're not. And, you know, you don't have to pretend to be somebody else when you're just you. (laughs) Can Can I speak from that point from the continuing education standpoint? Yeah. Just because it's certainly in CEs, I know some classes are really hot stuff, right? Like you got, like I remember cupping became really hot. Wow. You got to learn cupping. Why? Because everyone else is. Well, is that really you though? So I think that it's easy for people to jump on the, the bandwagon of, oh, this is the best class ever because it's hot, it's hot, it's hot. Well, but if it's not really you, well, that, that'll show if it's not really you authentically. Yeah, absolutely. It'll show in your work. Yeah. It will. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I have a couple of listener questions that I wanted to approach. Um, so we had one listener that said, how would you teach students about the city limitations on where they're allowed to practice, including building coding, special permits, and things like that. Everything that takes to basically get your business set up legally. Call the city directly. There's a, so there's going to be so much variance. Even if, if you're in a suburb of a big city, each of the 25 suburbs might give you different answers. So just calling directly, even though there's, it'd be nice if there was a one-stop shopping. Maybe that may be a business idea, Stephanie, is we create that for Phoenix. Hey, there you go. That would be so nice to have just like a list of every city, you know, and you can just go in there. Like one of the things that I find difficult is when you're looking for information about massage therapy requirements and stuff like that, like you got to find 25 different websites. Yes, to find exactly. the stuff that you want. And we I, know these, uh, this information changes uh, and ne- the, there's no notice on websites if information changes at, at the time. So really it's going to be about just calling directly to get the most current information, not on Facebook. 
<laughs> the other point that I'd like to make here is there's there's two entities you have to connect with your local city municipality county municipality but you also need to connect with your state massage therapy board because your state massage therapy board may have additional requirement that your city does not I can speak to Tennessee and in Tennessee we have a state massage establishment license. So the city may say, sure, we can issue you a business license because maybe you're selling retail. But if you're just doing massage, you don't need a business license. Your establishment license covers you. But if you're selling retail, you do need a business license. And so you need both. And so they, they not only, as Jimmy said, need to check with their local municipality, they also need to be making sure with their state board of what regulations and requirements there are. And one thing that I often see is people asking on massage Facebook groups and massage forums, what do I need to do for this? What do I should do for that? Always contact the source directly. Do not believe when you throw something out there, you may get four or five answers and they may be good intention, but may have inaccuracies. And so getting it straight from the source, especially in writing, is the key, because that can come back and save you from a lot of heartache down the road. So true. A lot of people do share information that that was true five years ago. But if I didn't have any sort of prompt to look at the website lately, I wouldn't have known it changed. So, yeah, so important. That's good. Great point. Mm -hmm, Absolutely. And I know like if you're going to sell retail, don't we need to have like a retailer license with the IRS and there's like sales tax usually that you might have to collect. So you might have to deal with your county on that issue as well. So that's another thing to think about. Generally, generally, I'm not a fan of your Facebook um, answers. You get a lot more opinions than true answers. Right. (laughs) Absolutely. And you don't know like who you're talking to. And so you never know what the person on the other side of the screen, like you don't know what their background is. And, you know, this may be somebody who has got years and years and years of professional experience, but unless you actually like make that click on their name and then you go follow who they are and then you go look them up, you have no idea who's talking to you. Right. Yeah. Always get it from the source. Okay. And then um, another question we had was, how can we adequately empower students to become something other than massage employees? Jimmy, that's you. <laughs> <laughs> indeed, yes, indeed. I, just, I, I had like like five different names of students that just ran through my head at the same time. You know, there's so many. We all, we all possess certain gifts, and I think that's how it's. It takes this the teacher to look at that student, discover their gifts, and really foster that within them. So it takes effort on my end as an entry level teacher, but it's definitely worth the efforts. And I think that I, I, I would hope that all massage therapist students are actively engaged in education. If they're not, those are the students that I would reach out to. Maybe they're sitting on the outskirts of the class. And I would on break times, like intentionally leave my podium and kind of go in the back of the room and strike up a conversation with people who I, who didn't really seem like they were really into what I was teaching. And because I know they all, everyone signs up for a certain reason. It's my job as a teacher to determine or find out why did you sign up for school? What's the why you care about your education and really feed that and make sure that we're really connecting on that level. Because it's, again, it's, everyone comes to school for a certain reason. And I want to make sure I'm really fulfilling you know, their perceived value of what massage education will be. For, for me, it's, as, and I come from a continuing ed, at this point in my career, from a continuing ed standpoint, with the Doormat and Diva, we have a course that is designed to go with it. And sort of the common thread through the course is, what is your vision? for your life, your situation, what's your dream? That establishes your compelling why. If you have a dream and a vision of being an Olympic massage therapist for the Olympic teams, then that is going to be what what rules your decisions, right? That's going to be your guiding North Star to make your decisions based on that. And maybe that means you need to be a solo practitioner to have the flexibility to accomplish those goals. Maybe being an employee for a firm that already does this. You know, it's, it's based on developing your vision, your dream 
of what you want. What's your story? And when you develop your story, that's when you're going to funnel into where your purpose is and how to get there. Mm -hmm. I love that. Very very well said. And Dee, I love that you said that because I remember the old uh, Arizona School of Massage Steiner Education, before they changed curricula, I think that was what you just said was really strong throughout their whole program. And then at some point, if some things fade away and then the business class is kind of, kind of got tailed off or curtailed at some point to make room for other classes. But ultimately, yeah, I thought what you're saying, because in the end, you know, success is really hard to define, but I need to help my students find what success really is to them. If I can share a quick quote on success I share in a lot of my classes, um, especially in my, uh, my, my CE classes with marketing, I like to share that success isn't just about what you accomplish. It's also about what you inspire others to do. So what does your business accomplish? Yeah, it's not just about making myself money, but really there should be a greater good for my business. And that's why, that's why in my business, I really, that's why I put in my bio there, you know, I want to inspire to make the industry more credible in the medical field. I want this industry to rise as a whole. I want other therapists to, you know, be inspired to make this industry better, not just make lots of money. So again, maybe that must be a way that we can help our students determine what does success mean to them, but success just can't be only about the money in the end. I want, I want, I want this industry to grow and how are you going to help this industry grow to bigger heights? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that too. One of the things I loved about my education, like I do vision boards every single year and we did that in school for our massage business. So I had this like really great vision board that I hung up for the first couple of years. I had it in my house and that really was kind of like the driving force of what it was that I wanted to do and the type of career that I wanted to pursue. And I did that, you know, it was something I could look at every single day. And, you know, we all did them. And I thought that that was a great project to actually have in school. And, you know, maybe you believe in the vision board, maybe you don't. Right. But like, but just having something in front of you that says, these are my goals and this is where I want to go. And maybe it changes over time, but a vision board is something that's like tangible. You can add to it. You can take things away from it. You know, you can do it on a monthly basis to set your goals. And I, I love that. That's one of my favorite things. Indeed. I think students always got a kick out of that in school. And I think that if you revise it every year, it's a very healthy practice. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So let's see, I got one more question, I think here. Um, So, and this is, I think is a really important question. What needs to be improved upon in the business education, in primary massage education? Like, what are we missing? For me, the simple answer to that is make it realistic. Mm -hmm make it obtainable, make it approachable, and make it realistic. Make it where a student can take the curriculum, go through it, and feel like I understood it, I get it, this is obtainable, and this is reachable. Because I could say to you, oh, you're going to need a million dollar budget and a 10,000 square foot building. You just shut people down, right? That's not obtainable. That's not approachable for your average person, but to say, you just need a corner somewhere. You can put a table up and hang a pretty curtain in the window and you can go to work. That's approachable and that's obtainable. So if the approach to the business development is approachable and obtainable, it's going to feel like I can do this. I can get this. I, I, I I got this. And it's realistic. I love that, especially if it's reinforced in the other courses as well, that yes, yes, you're learning this cool thing called shiatsu massage, and yes, you can use this in your practice, here's how. Love that answer. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give an answer kind of more towards administrators who might be listening to this is ensuring that there's enough time devoted in curricula for this. I've just noticed a trend over the years that many schools have kind of cut back the number of hours devoted to business and that hey, we want to make we want to make room for this other fun new class. Great. Awesome. I think I think many schools might end up teaching a lot of continuing education based courses and entry level because they will certainly sell seats. I understand that people do want to spend money on Thai massage and hey, your school has offers Thai. I want to come join your school. That's great. However, I fear that many schools are teaching so much advanced content that maybe the basic fundamentals are being 
overlooked or just taught too quickly, not enough time to master these basic fundamentals. So I just would kind of hope that maybe some school owners might hear this and uh, administrators might hear this and say, hey, you know, how much time are we, doing, are we devoting to ensuring our students master the fundamentals of massage, the primary principles and practices of massage before we get too fancy with the work a little later on? Mm -hmm. I think that's very important as well. In my business education course, my teacher was a, um, she had had uh, been a partner in a salon. And so she was doing massage there and, you know, she was like, I can, I can go on my own and I can do this better. Right. And I loved her stories. Teachers need to tell more stories. Um, you know, one of my other teachers, um, he basically told us a story, like he was a massage therapist, ended up becoming a chiropractor later, but he started his business literally in just like one tiny room with like one old wooden chair. And like he, his table was right. like, his table was like, he built it himself. And, you know, it wasn't anything that you think about when, you know, like we're used to walking into a massage envy or a hand in stone or something. And, you know, we see this really nice atmosphere that they have set up there, but like this can be done so much cheaper and easier. You know, all you have to do is just start. Right. Yeah. That's, that's the hardest part. I think just showing up, like, in, like in, when we teach yoga, sometimes we teach about, you know, showing up to the mat is half the battle. Once you <laughs> show up to the mat, you've already halfway done yoga. So same idea in massage school, you know, just simply showing up and making all small efforts every day will add up over time. So helping a student see that it is possible to do that is so key. Yeah, absolutely. So do you guys have anything else to add? I think this is basically all of the questions that I had for today, but um, were there any other talking points you wanted to kind of get across? I, I think I think one last kind of key piece is remembering that in massage, we're selling an experience, not just a hamburger and not just any regular good. We're, we're, we're selling an experience. We want to make sure that connecting with our clientele is so key to our work. And no matter how many fancy modalities, you know, and certificates on your wall, if I can't connect with someone and provide them a healing experience, then what are all those certificates really worth? Like my ability to really connect matters more than anything else. I think, uh, in my opinion, mm -hmm. I think that's really true too. Like the, the rapport piece of it is key to business to be able to see your client, you connect with them immediately. You have a, a story to share, or maybe they say something and you're like, oh yeah, I have that problem too. Or I've had this too, or, you know, that kind of just gives them that, like that personal feeling. And I think people really love that. Um, and then, so, so those pieces of like the, the consultation at the beginning, um, you know, how you exit the client, all of those like soft skills that I think we're always talking about. I think that those need to also be elevated in our education too, because, um, just being able to connect with your client, it, I think that table, like the table side manner is sometimes even more important than your hands-on skills. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. It's so yeah. true. And my, my, my ability to listen to really what matters most is going to be so key. Again, I, I can think I know all the anatomy in the world and all these books over my shoulder. But in the end of the day, all that knowledge is good to have. But if I'm not able to listen to you, then I may not be able to really serve you well. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you have to say, I don't know or this is out of my lane, but I know someone that specializes in this, or let me refer you to a colleague that I know does great work with this, or I really don't know, but I'm going to research it, or I'm going to talk to my mentor or my supervisor or my colleague, and I'm going to find some answers, or I'm going to do what I can to find things and not the fake it till you make it thing, more of a be real and transparent and say, this is what I do know about this, but I'm going to go get some more research and I'm going to go get some more knowledge about this. And next time you come, we're going to try some more things based on what I find out. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I like that too. And setting up that referral network, I think is so important. Like, you know, in a local area, you might have an acupuncturist, you might have a couple of chiropractors, like go meet those people because those right. people are complimentary to you. And you can even set up like a whole, um, you know, wellness plan for your clients based on having other providers like that, that are in your network and you can refer clients to each other too. So I think that's another really great way to get clients and make sure that you have those referrals that will keep your clients well, even beyond what you can do as a massage therapist. Indeed. What a great industry that we're in. What a blessing that we're in an industry that we're always going to keep learning more, no matter how many years in the field, we just keep on learning and growing. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. You too. Well, I think that that's it for today. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for coming on. It was so nice to meet you. It's so nice to see you again, Jimmy, as always. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, Dee. Thanks for joining us today on the USO LMT Massage Podcast. We hope you found this episode fun and informative. You can be a part of the making of our podcast by joining Massage Therapists Redefining the Future on Facebook, where you'll be able to choose the topics we discuss and send in questions to be answered on the show. Check us out at www.usolmt.com. Follow us on Facebook and LinkedIn at USOLMT. Join our Facebook group, Massage Therapists Redefining the Future. Follow us on Instagram and TikTok at USOLMT Massage Org. Let us know if you have any questions or would like more information by writing us at be the change at usolmt.com and be sure to download your free practice building resources under the resource menu of our website and check out this month's easy action steps that you can take to help positively impact our profession under the advocacy menu on the take action page. Check back each month for updates to these free resources and join us in our mission to empower every massage therapist.